one. Hi everyone, sorry we've had a little bit of a hitch this evening. There was a bit of an issue with the link, so I apologise for people who weren't able to get on straight away. Hopefully you found the um, new link. Um, not sure what went wrong. Now let's move on though uh, straight away to what we're going to be talking about tonight, which is two different topics. The first one is supplementary feeding and the second one is going to be American fowl breed. Now I'm focusing on these two things tonight just because they're a little bit topical at the moment. Um, you'll find coming into winter we need to have a bit of a think about supplementary feeding and make sure that we've um, considered whether we need to or not. And the other reason we're talking about, the, the reason we're talking about AFB is that I have had quite a few um, people call me about AFB lately and a little, a little bit more reports than we normally have for AFB. So whether or not that's higher reporting or actual higher incidence, we're not sure. But I thought now's a great time um, to really uh, consolidate some of our knowledge about AFB. So let's kick off though with talking about supplementary feeding. So why would you want a supplementary feed? bees. We should only really do it if they don't have enough food. So most of the time the bees can look after themselves. They are bringing in sufficient food, enough that not only will feed them, but we can take a little bit of their stores as well for ourselves. But in times when there is a, a, a drought or conditions are very poor, or maybe the hive is just really, really struggling, you might need to provide them with a little bit of supplementary food. So let's start by asking ourselves how much is enough? How much food do they really need to get through? We normally suggest about three quarters of a box of honey for the autumn and winter to get them through that period. Now I say autumn and winter here, but what I really mean is periods of dearth, periods when they don't have access to sufficient nectar. So this um, in the southern areas where it's cooler, it's usually autumn and winter. Some other areas, particularly out west, it's often then periods of drought when there's just not enough rainfall. And it can actually be the inverse when you go up into North Queensland. It could be that it's just rained for a really long period of time and they haven't been able to get out and feed. So it depends on where you are, what that period of dearth might look like. But during that period, you need to make sure that there's gonna be enough stores in there, in the hive to get them through that period. And so it depends a bit on the circumstances at any time of year what you might consider a, a sort of a threshold to have to feed your bees. So you need to think, okay, how much food have they got? What are they bringing in at the moment? Are they bringing in plenty of uh, honey? And what are we expecting the floral resources to be over the next little while? So how stressed are the plants? How much nectar are they likely to put out? And how many plants are likely to be flowering? So it is a little bit of a, a sort of a balancing act when it comes to figuring out whether or not we need to feed our bees. And for a new beekeeper, it always pays to see if you could talk to someone in the local area who's a bit more experienced, who might have a good understanding of what it's likely to happen over the next little while, considering how the weather pattern is coming um, together and how much stores your hive has in there. The other thing to keep in mind too is that just because there are flowers around doesn't always mean that there is sufficient food. Particularly after long periods of drought, we find that sometimes the, the plants will produce flowers, but there's not much in the way of nectar in those flowers. So it can be easy to be fooled that, you know, oh look, all these plants are flowering, but my, your, honey, your bees might not be bringing back any of that nectar. So keep an eye on that as well. So in terms of food, what do bees need? Well, bees need both nectar, which provides them with energy, and pollen, which provides them with flower, with a protein. 
And different flowers have different amounts. So you might find some flowers are very high in nectar and have almost no pollen and vice versa. So they need a good balance of different types of flowers. Now, if that isn't available, if you're finding there isn't sufficient food, you've got a couple of options as a beekeeper. You can move your bees to somewhere that there is sufficient food. And this is what many of our big commercial beekeepers in particular do. If the food dries up in one area, they'll go to a new area. And this means that the bees will have a constant source of sufficient food. Not always possible though. Um, sometimes there's just very large areas that food's not available. There's nowhere to move your bees to. Or of course, if you're a hobby beekeeper and you've just got a couple of hives in your backyard, that might also not be an option for you. And in that case, you might need to supplement. Now, I'm gonna start by talking about supplementation uh, for nectar. So if there's not enough nectar in the flowers that are in the area or not enough flowers, and you've got low levels of honey in your hive. In this case, what you can do is provide sugar to your bees. Never honey, with the one exception being unless that honey has come out of that same hive. So don't take honey from a different hive, put it into another hive, or even honey that's come off the shelf, don't put it into your hive. And the reason that we don't do this is because AFB can be spread in honey and you just don't know what different honeys have in them and, and the chances that you might get an infection. So it's really important to make sure that you're feeding sugar not honey to your bees. And there's a couple of different ways you can feed the sugar. You can either feed it as a dry powder, as you can see in the photograph here, or you can mix it up and make it into a sugar syrup. Now, having a sugar syrup is actually a little bit more advantageous in many ways for your bees because the bees, in order to use that sugar, have to mix it with water anyway. And so if you've given them the water already there, it's a little bit less work bringing in that, that water to to um, turn the dry sugar into a liquid is going to uh, use up a lot more time and energy of your bees. So if you can do it for them, it will help them out. Now, most of the time what we're um, doing when we're supplementary feeding bees and um, sugar water is we're trying to get them through that period where they're not doing so well and we're just trying to get them to survive and have enough storage to get through that time period, whether it be that they're really just struggling as a hive or that there's not enough food around. And when we were doing this, we want to have two parts sugar to one part water. The other option that some people um, might use at different times is they may uh, use a sugar supplement in order to stimulate brood rearing in the hive, particularly if they're going to something like a pollination event, when they want to make sure that they've got lots of brood quite early sometimes um, before there's a good flowering event in the area. And in this case, they drop that level of sugar down to one part sugar, one part water to simulate for brood rearing. The type of sugar you should be using is really just regular white cane sugar. Um, if you start using different types of sugar or process sugar process in different ways, you can make your uh, bees really quite sick. So you need to stick with that plain white cane sugar. Um, wherever possible, try and feed within your hive. Um, in some cases, of course, that might not be as easy if the commercial beekeepers often find that they have to feed on mass, and so it's just not a possibility, but we strongly encourage, particularly our hobby beekeepers and anyone with just a few hives, to try and keep that uh, feeding within their hive so that they minimise any spread of pests and diseases that could potentially occur when bees are mingling. Uh, and also if you're putting that uh, food into your hive, try and do so kind of later in the evening to try and reduce any robbing uh, of bees. Bees that kind of are, are just hanging out near there and, and see what you're doing and think, oh, gee, look, there's a good food source. I might come over and steal some from that particular hive. And you also need to keep an eye on how much you're feeding as well. We do not want to feed more than we really need to. One, it's expensive, of course, but two, um, it can, if the food's left around, if you've got sugary water left around for more than a couple of days, you might find it ferments. It gets other types of fungus or bacteria growing in it, which is not good for your bees. So we want to make sure that it's being used up and it's being cleaned up really quickly. 
So what we usually suggest is about one to two litres every two to four days, but keep a good eye on that. You might need to increase it a little, may need to decrease it. So wherever possible, keep it at that minimum amount. Here's just some images of some of the types of feeders. These are in high feeders. The one in the top left hand side is a top feeder. So that's a tray you put your sugar water in and it just goes in the top of your hive. You could also put it in a frame. So this one just sits like a normal frame within your hive and the bees can uh, take the sugar water from the top. You can also, of course, do it, have a do it yourself option. Um, a common one is to put your sugar water in a Ziploc bag and then just put a tiny little hole in that Ziploc bag and the bees will come and slowly feed from the drips that come out of that hole. And similarly, you can do the same kind of thing with a jar, put it on the top of your hive, put the lid over the top and a little hole in the lid of that jar that just slowly dribbles out your, your sugar water. And here are some examples of different types of open feeders that might be used by commercial beekeepers. You can see um, most commonly it's usually a big drum and the bees can come and feed from that drum. In the bottom left hand corner you can see someone has constructed one that's got lots of um, bits of sort of straw and sticks. Now the reason I've done this is to give the bees something to land on, but keep in mind of course that this is going to be an excellent breeding ground for all sorts of other things to come in and access. And it can also be a place where you can get um, a lot of fermentation occurring if it's not changed out really, really regularly. Now I'm gonna move on from feeding um, supplements when there's not enough nectar to what to do if there's not enough pollen. Now, I've recently been to the uh, Queensland Beekeepers Association conference and we had some excellent speakers there who have talked a bit about pollen and pollen supplements and some of the more recent research. And I really wanted to share some, share some of the results with you tonight. So if there's not enough pollen around, one thing that beekeepers often do is to feed their bees supplementary pollen. So this is sometimes... Um, pollen that's been irradiated. Of course, you've got to irradiate it, otherwise you have that risk of AFB coming into your hive, um, either with honey or with pollen. Um, or it can be a, a substitute for pollen, which is mostly what commercial um, bee patties are, is um, they don't normally contain very much or if any actual pollen, but they're kind of a formula of things to try and replicate what's in pollen. And there's been quite a lot of mixed results on the effectiveness of pollen supplements. Some studies find that they're very effective, some find that they're not particularly effective. But mostly the consensus is they tend to only be effective when there's not available pollen for the bees. So bad weather, when the bees aren't able to collect it, or when there just isn't sufficient pollen available. So I would suggest to consider only kind of supplementing your pollen when you think there's really a dearth of pollen availability for your bees. And to do so with a little bit of caution as well. Some of the studies have shown that the addition of pollen, particularly pollen substitutes, can increase the likelihood or the, or the, the um, amount of uh, black queen cell virus, and it may impact on the levels of Nisema, deformed wing virus, and Ferrara as well, if we ever ended up with those uh, nasty pests. And so those higher levels of protein not only might help your bees, but they might help some of those bee pests. So we need to consider using pollen supplements quite carefully. Pollen substitutes have only been found to be used by adult bees. It isn't fed to the larvae and it isn't stored within the hive. And so although those knock-on effects will have um, effects to the health of your hive, making sure that there's enough uh, protein available for the adult bees, it doesn't seem to have any impacts on those uh, emerging bees or those bee larvae. And the final thing that your bees need in terms of um, nutrients and supplements is water. And water is a really key one. It's important to not forget that your bees need to have a sufficient source of water close by, preferably capillary water, so somewhere they can land and drink. So um, having areas with bits of sandy um, soil where the water can seep up and they can access it from there is really important. And bees actually tend to 
they prefer dirty water. <laughs> water that has plants or algae in it. Um, uh, many a good intentioned beekeeper has gone to a lot of effort to make a very beautiful, clean water source for their bees, only to find the bees then prefer a dirty puddle over to the side. So um, they do often like the water that's got a little bit more biological um, input into it. And in particular, uh, in your, if you're in a very hot area, make sure that water is relatively close to your hive. In, in very hot areas, you know, even within 200 metres of your hive. So bees aren't having to make long trips to bring water back to the hive. So that's all I really wanted to touch on tonight in terms of supplementary feeding. Now I want to focus a little bit more on American fowl breed disease. And I want to talk about this because it is a really important disease. It's one that has a big impact. And if you get it as a beekeeper, um, it will change the way you feel about um, looking after your bees in many cases. Um, it's an important one that beekeepers are, qu are quite aware of. So what is American fowl breed disease or AFB? It's a bacterial disease. It will weaken and eventually kill your hive. It's also what we call a notifiable disease. And what that means is if you come across it or if you suspect you might have it, you need to let the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries know. So you can send in your lab test, that's sufficient, or you can give uh, the call centre a call or your local apiary officer a call and let them know. Um, and that helps us track it. Now, why is AFB such an us disease? Why is it often a focus? Um, this is largely because of the two different stages or states that AFB has. It has a vegetative state when it's reproducing, and it, then it has this spore state. And these spores are the real difficult thing when it comes to managing AFB. The spores are really tough. They're really, really hard to kill. So a lot of things that you would normally use to kill a bacteria, you won't find have much success at killing AFB. The spores are also viable for a really long time, so they can last over 50 years outside a bee. So you can have a piece of equipment that's had AFB on it, put it in a back shed for 45 years, it's not seen a bee, bring it out, put bees in it, and those bees can get AFB. So it lasts a very long time and, and can continue to infect for a long time. And to top that off, it's also very easily spread. So it really hits all of those things that make it a nasty pathogen. Lots of people ask me, but where is AFB? I don't think it's in my local area. Well, unfortunately, it's been reported from over most of areas, areas within Queensland. I've just got a little map here of some of the major um, areas we have had reports over the last 12 months. Um, we've also had a few anecdotal uh, reports from further west, um, even you know, quite far out west of beekeepers with AFB. However, I don't feel this is necessarily a really good representation of all the places that have had AFB in the last 12 months, because many cases I find go unreported, and therefore we don't have a really accurate estimate of the prevalence or location of AFB. Um, I have had an increase lately in the uh, number of people reporting to me, which is great, but we need a lot more. And we need to have every hive with AFB reported. If you have one hive now and report it, and then in six months time you have another hive that has AFB, you need to report that one as well. Not just the first instance you get it, but every instance. And of course, the prevalence will change with the weather and with the season a little bit as well. And that could be why we're seeing quite a few reports at the moment. So how do beekeepers find out if they've got AFB? Well, you need to inspect your brood regularly. So we're suggesting every four to six weeks is a good kind of time frame to be inspecting your hive to make sure that that AFB isn't getting out of control really quickly. It can bring your hive down quite quickly. And so as we come into winter, if you're in some of these southern areas, you probably want to not do every four to six weeks. You want to leave it a bit longer and maybe not open your hive if possible. But you do want to do a last check before it gets too cold, then close down your hive. Um, if you're in a northern area, you can continue, and you know, it's quite tropical, you can continue that, those checks regularly, generally throughout the year. So what are we looking for when we're opening in our hive and looking in the brood? So we want to look in the brood box, that's the bottom one with the baby bees in it. You want to look at every single frame and I would suggest you want to look at every single cell. Um, we want to find AFB at one cell. We don't want to find it when the whole um, 
hive is overrun with it because at that point it's usually spread to other hives in the local area. So we're looking for a range of symptoms when we look at our frames. We're looking at the pattern of the brood. So if it looks uneven, a shotgun type pattern, that's an indicator you need to look much closer. And what we're really looking for are any cells that are sunken or dark. So the cappings of them will be kind of flat or um, concave and a slightly different or darker colour to the cells around them. Um, we're also looking for cells that have holes in the capping. So if the capping um, has a hole right in the middle and you can see a bee moving underneath, it often means that it's just about to hatch. So don't worry too much about those ones. But if the holes around the edge and you can't see any movement underneath it, it's a good idea to inspect that one a little bit closer. And another sign of AFB can be that there's a smell that's kind of foul or acidic in the hive. Now, don't rely on this one as a, an indicator that you have AFB, because by the time you've got a nasty smell in your hive, you've got a very late stage infection. You've probably missed um, the early stages. We want to catch, try and catch it before that, that occurs. But that, if you do open your hive and you notice the smell, that's definitely an indicator you need to look really close for AFB. So once you've seen any of these indicators, you want to go to those cells that look a little bit suspicious. You want to look at any cell that looks suspicious. Um, even just one cell within the hive could be a, a sign of an infection. But um, once you've found that cell, you think, oh, that one's a bit strange, a bit dodgy. Take a matchstick, poke it into the cell, swirl it around a little bit, pull that matchstick out and see what comes out. So if you're getting a brown gooey substance, that should ring alarm bells and you should go, oh no, that could be AFB, could also be EFB, which I'll talk about in a minute, but that's what we're looking for. If instead what comes out is kind of a chalky, dry, mouldy looking larvae, that's chalk brood, slightly less of a problem. We don't need to be quite as concerned and um, we've dealt with chalk brood in, in some of our previous talks. I'm not going to talk too much about today. Similarly, if you have sac brood, so if what comes out of the cell is a fluid filled sort of sac, um, then that would be likely to be sac brood. And again, that's a, a slightly different pathogen and, and one of somewhat less concern. But if we're getting this brown gooey substance, we could have American or European foul brood. And it can be really difficult to tell the difference between the two without a lab test. Now, in general, if the goo that you have that comes out, the brown goo, is three to five centimetres, so it strings out for about that distance, then it's possibly AFB. And if it's stringing out less than a centimetre and a half, it's likely EFB. But the real catch here is that there is a secondary infection that travels around with EFB that gives it the same look as AFB. It'll string out the same distance as AFB. So you really do need a lab test to be sure whether or not we've got AFB or EFB. So why is it important that I know if one disease or the other? Well, there's a few really important reasons. The first one is that EFB infected hives can recover on their own and AFB hives won't. So you're going to have to make that, have that knowledge to make that decision whether or not you need to step in. And even if you, you find it is EFB, EFB hives can be treated with an antibiotic, the antibiotic OTC, which AFB hives cannot. And the reason we can't treat a hives with AFB with an antibiotic is because of those resistant spores that we talked about before. So EFB doesn't tend to have those really resistant spores. If you treat EFB with the antibiotic a couple of times, you kill all of the nasty bacteria and your hive will recover. On the other hand, if it's AFB and you put antibiotic on it, a few of those cells in there that are reproducing might get affected by the antibiotic and you might kill them. But you've got all those resistant spores, a huge number, a huge stockpile of resistant spores that then as soon as you stop using that antibiotic, those spores will germinate and you'll have an infection again. So as, you, as we talked about before, those spores can last 50 years. So you would have to keep treating it for at least 50 years before you'd end up kind of knocking it on the head with the OTC. So we can't treat um, AFB infected hives with OTC. And that's also in our legislation here in Queensland that you're not allowed to do that. And finally, AFB hives must be destroyed or irradiated. 
but ear beehives don't need to be. And unfortunately, from time to time, I talk to beekeepers who don't wait for their test to come back um, and go ahead and, and destroy their hives and then find out later that it's EFB and not AFB and they maybe didn't have to destroy their hives. It's totally fine if you do and if you want to be on the safe side, particularly if you don't think you're going to get back to your hive for a while and you think, OK, if I destroy it, then it's safe, then that's great. But um, if you really want to keep your hive, consider waiting until your test comes back before you act, because it could be that you have EFB, not AFB. So what if you see your goo and you think, OK, I do have one of these two. How do I go about finding out which one? There's a couple of different ways you can do that. You can do a matchstick test or a matchstick sample, or you can do a brood comb sample. So if you want to do the matchstick sample, take that same matchstick you use to, to look in the cell, cover it in as much goo as you can, stick it in a little sealed jar, and send it off to our labs, the Biosecurity Sciences Lab, for testing along with a sample submission form. How if, on the other hand, you're not really sure exactly which cell it was and you just have a feeling that, you know, there's a smell in your hive and some of the cells look a bit dodgy, you can send a whole piece of brood comb. So a 10 centimetre by 10 centimetre piece of that brood comb. Wrap it up in paper rather than putting it in a little plastic jar and then also have that sample submission form with it when you send it in. In the meantime, when you're waiting for your test to come back, don't use any of your equipment on any of your other hives as you might infect them as well. So how did it get into your hive? How did AFB or EFB get into your hive? There's a few different routes. One of the most common one is robber bees, so bees that are coming into your hive from a different hive to steal honey or wax or pollen. Um, or it could be drift, they accidentally went into that hive, they weren't actually there to steal specifically. Um, they could be that it's coming on infected hives or infected equipment or bees that you've got secondhand from somewhere. Um, and it can also come in from honey or pollen that's being fed to bees. So if bees are being fed something that's infected, and as I mentioned earlier, it's really important when you're supplementary feeding bees not to feed them honey, to feed them sugar. Um, this is why, because they can bring in that AFB infection. Now, once the spores may have got into the hive, they're fed to the larvae with the honey. They get into the larvae's gut and they germinate and consume the larvae from within. So it's pretty gruesome. Um, and then when the bees eventually go to try and clean out any of these cells, they are thousands and millions of um, spores that then get spread throughout the hive. And so you get more and more infection going through your hive. So if your test comes back and you have AFB, you'll get an email to confirm from the lab to tell you that. You also get a phone call from me just to check in that you uh, know what to do next and to make sure that you don't need any particular advice. I'll talk you through anything you're not sure about. Um, in the meantime, of course, you should be isolating any equipment you used on that hive. And then what you need to do, once the bees are returned in the evening uh, from foraging, you want to seal up the hive. So you can see here I put some tape around a hive to keep them in there. And then unfortunately, you do need to kill all the bees in your hive. There's a few different ways we can go about this. We can place the brood box with the bees in the freezer if you've got somewhere where you've got enough freezer space. Keep in mind you need to take the food stores out though because those bees, if they've got food, will last a very long time even in a freezer. So get rid of all their food stores first. Another way you can go about killing them is to shake your bees into a bucket of soapy water or to drench them by tipping the soapy water into the hive. And if you don't intend to destroy your hive, uh, sorry, to use your hive again, if you intend to destroy it, you can also go down the route of using a pesticide powder to kill the bees. Now, I often get asked the question, but, oh, sure the hive has AFB, but I've got lots of honey in there, can I use it? The answer is yes, you can harvest your honey. Um, keeping in mind the whole time whenever you're dealing with it that AFB spores are going to be in the honey and in the wax. Um, and so you, you need to consume the honey and make sure it doesn't get passed on, fed to bees, left out or exposed where the bees can, can get to it. And similarly for the wax, make sure that bees don't have access to that. 
I would be cautious about how you go about extracting it. Um, if you're using your regular extracting equipment, make sure you're cleaning it very, very thoroughly after you've um, put the, the frames that may be infected with AFB in there. Um, if possible, if you can use different different set of equipment or a different way of going about it, extracting it, that can mean that you're minimising your risk. And make sure that those frames that you have extracted are destroyed or irradiated, preferably destroyed after you've extracted that honey. So you've got rid of the honey, you've killed your bees, then you have two options as to what you do with your hive. You can either sterilise it or you can destroy it. So often people go the sterilisation route if they're really keen on their hive, they want to keep it. Um, it can be a bit expensive and so people who are not particularly attached to their hive or it's an old hive, they may go down the destruction route. It's really up to you what you decide you want to do. Um, to sterilise your hive first, make sure the honey and debris is out of the hive. That's really um, an important one because if anything leaks out of your hive during irradiation, there's quite a big fine from the irradiation plant um, for the cleanup. So make sure it's, it's free from honey or anything that could leak out. Then you want to seal it up some black plastic or really heavy duty uh, plastic bags. And the only place um, here in Queensland that does uh, radiation is a place called Steritech. And they offer two different options for irradiation, 10 kilograys or 15 kilograys of radiation. Now, you only need 10 kilograys to kill AFB, but if you go up to the next level 15, it will kill pretty much all the other things that might be in your hive. So it'll kill EFB, if wax moths, anything that's lurking in there. So if your hive is a regular wooden hive, I strongly suggest go that higher level of irradiation and then you're starting with a really clean hive. However, if your hive is plastic or if it's a flow hive, that high level of radiation is really going to degrade that plastic and make it very brittle. So in that case, we recommend that you go for the lower level, the 10 kilograys. It's going to make sure it takes care of the AFB. And in this case as well, make sure you've got that lab test to, to say that it definitely is AFB, because if it's not, if it's EFB, then the 10 kilograys is not going to be effective against it. You need the higher level. Now, radiation is safe, doesn't leave any residue. It's a really good way to go. Um, and you'll come back with a clean hive. You can also include your other things in there. I usually put my suit and my tool in the hive and get that irradiated as well. But you don't want to have honey or frames within that hive. The other option if you don't go sterilization is destruction. So first um, you need to check that you can have a fire because you need to burn the hives. So check for fire bans and make sure you've got any appropriate permits that are required. Then you want to dig a bit of a ditch, about 30 centimetres, a bit of a hole, and then you want to burn all your hives and equipment in a hot, hot fire so it burns all the way through. Now, particularly if you've got lots of honey, this can take a really long time and it can be hard to get that honey to be consumed, so you'll need a very hot fire. Once it's burned right through, you then want to cover it over, so you want to bury all of those final remains, just in case there's anything left that the bees might access, so make sure it's all buried. Keep um, in mind too that you need to consider all the different things that might have come in contact with the inside of your hive. Some are more high risk items than others and one of the most high risk of course is your gloves. Now um, I would suggest you get rid of them. <laughs> um, if you're not going to send them to irradiate them, burn them, destroy them, get rid of them. It's not worth the risk of trying to clean them or do anything with them because the chances that they've got the infection on them is very, very high. So they're a key um, risk. Other tools you might consider because they've been in the, in the hive or touched something inside the hive are, of course, your hive tool. And you can actually treat your hive tool by using a very, very hot flame. We're not talking about sticking it in your smoker and swirling it around here. We're talking more of a blowtorch kind of hot. It has to get very, very hot. The other um, one might to consider might be your smoker. If you've got wax or honey that's come from your inside the hive, on your gloves and on your smoker, that can be a source of a contamination. Now, most of the time, if, you, if your suit's fairly clean, washing it in some hot water um, is usually generally enough to, to make sure that it's clean enough that you're not going to cross-contaminate. 
You can also send it off, of course, to be irradiated. I always do mine regularly to make sure that we're keeping it clean. So think about what have I touched inside the hive? What have I touched with my gloves that have touched inside the hive? Make sure you cover up on all those bases to prevent that contamination spreading to other hives. Um, as someone who goes to a lot of hives and visits a lot of hives, it's always my rule to start with a clean, fresh pair of rubber gloves, like washing up gloves, and get rid of them at the end of looking in that hive, and that just minimises my risk. And similarly, if you're going to visit somebody and look in their hive, I'd suggest that you do the same. Don't take um, gloves from your house into someone else's hive and then bring them back. Chances are you might spread disease one way or the other. So when I give you a call and we talk about what you're going to do with AFB, question always comes from the person who has the infection. Ah, where did this come from? How did I get it? Well, there's lots of different ways you might have picked it up. Um, questions to ask yourself is, has someone else's equipment gloves been used in my hive or have I used mine in theirs? Could it come from there? Um, have I recently got any new equipment, frames, bees that secondhand that might, might be infected? Also consider how long you might have had your hive or frames and what condition they were in when you got them. Remembering that AFB can stay dormant in a hive for a certain period of time. So it could be that you got had AFB when you got your hive, always an option. Um, and also, is there anything new in your local area? New hives, whether they be managed hives or feral hives, they could be a source. Often it's really difficult for, track, for us to track down where AFB has come from. And so, it's also therefore really difficult to know if AFB could be in your local area. It probably is. The key thing is to continue to check regularly in your own hive so that you can detect it when it does pop its head up. Then, of course, once you've dealt with the hive that is the problem, your next thought is probably, oh, what about my other hives? What am I going to do about the hives that I have that might be infected? Well, for a start, of course, the key thing is to not use your gloves equipment on those hives, at least until they've been irradiated. And then you need to check your, your, your other hives for any signs of symptoms. And I suggest doing it pretty regularly for you know, even that first six months period so that you're keeping an eye on it and looking for any changes. The quicker you pick it up in one of the other hives means that it might stop it from spreading to any other hives. Also, of course, taking care when moving between your other hives. If you haven't picked up an infection that's there already and you take it on your gloves from one hive to the next, of course, you'll be kicking yourself later that that could have been prevented. And then finally, of course, how can you prevent another infection? It's a tricky one, um, particularly with those robber bees and the drift. If those are the the pathways through which AFB gets into your hive, it can be difficult to prevent them. But there are a few things that you can do to make sure that you minimise your chance of getting it. Firstly, of course, good hygiene and prevention of cross-contamination. So if you can use different items, different tools, different gloves on each of your hives, of course, that only works if you've only got a few hives. If you've got more hives, putting a barrier system in place. So we had a great talk, our last talk um, from Rod Burt talked all about barrier systems and how they help prevent this, this widespread um, spreading of AFB. So that can really help. Good husbandry, of course, can make sure your hives are strong and prevent robbing. And the key one here, of course, is a regular inspection, catching those infections earlier, early as possible to prevent them spreading to other hives. That's all I have tonight in terms of content. I just want to make everybody aware um, that because I am going to be going on leave, I've set up a new email and this is going to be a, a sort of generalised email for Bee Biosecurity questions. You can start using it now if you like. I already check it. And that email is b.biosecurity at daf.qld.gov.au. And of course, if you've got any questions, you can always contact the call centre and they will be able to help you. On now to uh, any questions we might have for tonight.
We don't have any questions just yet. I'm going to um, see if uh, Hamish, you might have any tips there on uh, AFB or supplementary feeding that you wanted to share with us. Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. Yeah, I think you've covered the um, the topics well. Um, if I have anything to add, it's um, I guess you know just be um, vigilant all the time with the AFB um, awareness. I guess um, you know it's sadly a case that um, AFB slips by someone's notice, and before long, uh, it's quite a disaster to deal with. So um, you know, with all these things, the earlier the better in detection. So that's the take home message there. Um, and also there is a lot of help around, um, although you may be new into bees, um, there is a lot of um, uh, help within bee clubs, um, within the department uh, to guide you along the way as well. Um, and some of these things you've spoken about, Rebecca, um, you know, uh, uh, not really um, foremost in your mind when you're in the midst of, of dealing with it all and where you go, go to, uh, in your individual circumstance. So, um, you know, having someone with a bit of experience, um, it goes a long way. Thanks, Hamish. Yeah, I think that's really important. And to keep in mind that um, anything that looks a bit unusual in your hive, it's worth investigating, giving someone at DAF a call and we can um, guide you through to how to take a sample if you're not sure. Um, I get lots of people who, look in their hive and think, oh, something's not quite right. What do I do next? And they give me a call and we can really easily get you to the point where you've submitted a sample and we can find out what the problem might be. Sometimes it's something simple and, and it's not a problem. Sometimes it can be AFB, but these things are, are quite uh, straightforward in terms of how we manage them. And so it's really um, lots of help out there for beekeepers if you're not sure about uh, what to do next. So that looks like um, we don't have too many questions tonight. Unfortunately, hopefully not too many people got tripped up by the problem with our link. But of course, this talk will be recorded and we'll have it up on our YouTube channel uh, pretty quickly. So within the end of the week, it'll be up there for anybody who's missed it. Uh, remembering that the, we're back at our reg regular um, schedule come next month, which is the first Tuesday of the month, which will be the 3rd of uh, August. And um, I'm looking forward to that very last talk um, and I hope to see you all there. Thank you. Good night.